So when it comes to modesty, I think there are three aspects to modesty, which I'll cover. Um, the first one is wearing clothes that draw attention to themselves. So, you know, because what, what does modesty mean? Modesty means that you're not drawing attention to yourself. You're very you're modest. So, three aspects, I think, to modesty. First one is wearing clothes that are immodest. So, wearing clothes that draw attention to themselves. And I'm just going to go through the principles this week. I'm not going to mention so much specifics because I want to do that next week. So, first of all, clothes that draw attention to themselves. We see in 1 Timothy 2, it says here in verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. So what is sobriety? So sobriety is when you're being serious. You're sober. You're clear. You know, when you put on your clothes, you're doing it with a clear mind. You're thinking about what you're actually wearing. Um, and you're serious about it. So, you know, and I guess when it comes to, you know, you see men these days, sometimes they, they you know, they, they, you know, I just did the, at work this photo shoot with this photographer and, and his pants were like those hipster pants and then his shirt was like this tight shirt and every time like he would bend down to like move the, the things that he was taking photos of, you, know, you can see his undies, you can see his, his butt crack and I'm just thinking like, did this guy think about like what he actually wore that day? You know, was he being sober like thinking, okay, I'm putting on pants and pants is meant to be like covering my body and then every time I bend over, I could, the, people could just see everything anyway. Like, did you really sort of think through what you were going to wear that day. Um, you know, so we ought to think through and be sober about what we wear. So that men, you know, they have to pull their pants up. You know, like why, why wear a hat and then wear it crooked? To me, that's just silly. But um, that seems to be the fashion these days. You know, they wear, you know, just straighten the hat, you know, wear your pants properly. But when it comes to girls, you know, maybe not so much the girls that, that sort of uh, in Australia, but I find, uh, you know, amongst the Asian culture when I was at high school and things, you know, girls would just dress in these crazy hairdos and, and, and weird outfits that they look like a cartoon character. You know, like they're wearing overalls like Mickey Mouse. You know, they're, 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 they've got like the coloured hair like anime characters and, you know, the fancy hairdos. Even guys will have like the fancy hairdos. They want to look like, you know, like the ninjas on Naruto. Um, so it's sober. And, you know, I think when somebody looks at you, how you dress, they shouldn't think, you know, you're a cartoon character. You know, are you trying to look like an anime character? Like, you should, they should think that you're trying to be serious in the way you dress. Um, f let's go back to 1 Peter 3. <clears throat> look at verse 4, it says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So one principle we can glean from there is, you know, a woman ought to be meek and quiet, you know, humble, quiet. So don't you think her clothing should also give that appearance? You know, we, we hear about people, they wear clothes and you'll say something like, oh, that's a really loud outfit. You know, I don't think that's the sort of impression people should get when they look at a, how a Christian woman dresses. You know, saying, well, that's a really loud outfit. That, that's like, you know, saying a lot of things, it's making a bold statement. You know, it, it ought to be this spirit of a meek and quiet spirit. I think this is how we ought to dress as well. Clothes that don't, that are not loud, that don't draw attention to themselves. Um, you know, we see here that, you know, wives ought to be in subjection. It says here in verse 5, you know, being in, in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as you do well. And are not afraid with any amazement. So I see here, you know, sobriety, um, clothing that is meek and quiet. I, I mean, clothing that is submissive. I, I don't even know, I'm not, so I'm not going to really get into specifics because the Bible doesn't say specifics, but when somebody looks at your clothing, do, do they see like a rebellious teenage girl? Or do they see a modest Christian woman? You know what I mean? So uh, this is the things you've got to think of, you know, rebellious attitude. You know, do, do, do you dress just to look different? You know, just to be different, just to rebel. Or, you know, are you wearing something that you know your husband or you know your father won't like, but you wear it anyway? You know, this rebellious attitude in how you dress. Now, one thing I want to say here in terms of clothes that draw attention to themselves, I do not believe that these passages are teaching that it is always wrong to wear what is mentioned in these verses. And I'll explain in a second. I believe it's talking about your lifestyle. Like when it talks about, like the Bible talks about moderation. The Bible talks about modesty here. But that doesn't mean there isn't a time for wearing of gold and putting on costly hair, costly array and doing up your hair. 
I believe it's talking about your lifestyle in general. If you see here in 1 Peter 3, the, converse, the, the, the um, context here is the conversation of the wives. I mean, it's a husband looking at his wife's life in general, or to be modest, or not to be the adorning of the outward. Um, we see in uh, 2 Timothy 2, the context of this passage is how we appear to the world. Um, see, look here, it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may, may, we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, why do I say that it, it can't be a sin to put on gold and jewels and costly array? Um, I'll explain why. Because I believe that there are situations where... I guess what would be deemed as immodest clothes, if you were to wear them every day, are not necessarily sinful. Um, let me give you two examples from the Bible. So in Exodus 28.2. So I'm just trying to build a sound position here. So Exodus 28, you remember when the garments were made for the priests. I mean, these garments were expensive garments made of blue, you know, scarlet or whatever, and, and the jewels that would be on it. And look at what it says here. It says, and thou shalt make, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. So these garments were specifically made to be worn by the priest for glory and for beauty, to be admired, to be looked at. Um, so, so I guess if you were to wear these every day, it would be immodest. But it's made for a specific purpose and therefore it's modest. So if you think about what makes clothes modest and immodest, I guess it's about suiting the occasion. You know, it's like if you went to a funeral and you wear bright red. I mean, that's immodest at the funeral. But if you're at like a, a, a dress-up party, hey, bright red, it's modest because it's, it's expected. So it's about what's expected. I mean, modesty is a subjective term, and that's why you can't just say, oh, gold is immodest because there is a time to wear gold. Or you say, like, costly array is immodest. But there's a time where costly array is suitable, um, and it's about wearing things that are suitable for the occasion and what's expected. There's another passage in verse Exodus 28, 40 that says the same thing, but I'll go on. Uh, look here, Revelation 21, 2. Talks about the new city, but look at what it compares the new city to. And I, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now generally when you have a wedding, a bride is adorned with jewels, with costly array. She might have broidered hair, but is she sinning? No, right? She can't be if God is saying, well, he's, he's adorning it. But I mean, uh, I'll show you this verse in Isaiah 61.10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. So he's saying here that God is clothing him like a bride and groom adorn themselves for their wedding day. The bride is being adorned with jewels. And jewels include gold, because I believe there's a verse in the Bible that says like a, a jewel of gold in a pig's snout. This is like a woman without discretion. So even like say a ring, according to the Bible, I think would be considered like a jewel, not just, uh, you know, stones. But my point is, you know, why is this okay? Because it's not, you're not getting married every day. Like if, if how you dress at your wedding is how you dress every day, then you're being immodest because that's ought not to be your life. You know, but there are times where quote unquote immodest clothing is modest because it suits the occasion. Like a wedding, like the priests were decked. Um, and you're not being immodest. There's these one time things where it is suitable. You know, other possible scenarios might be like a fancy dress party, right? You know, people go, they go to a themed party. I remember on my 18th birthday party, um, or was it my 21st? I can't remember now. We had like a Bible themed birthday, you know, I buy, and then, you know, people came like dressed as like kings and queens. And I remember my brother and I and these other couple of other guys, we all came as Roman soldiers. <laughs> so we were like in these little skirts. And like, it was funny because we were like standing outside like the, 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 the function room and it was like you know, it's Roman soldiers like security cards and then we were like, pra we were like playing on the, on the bridge like just like having spas and like taking photos and stuff so you know, that's a, you know that might be like a similar scenario right where it's like a one occasion where it's, you're not being immodest because it's expected that you're wearing clothes that are you know, going to be fun and draw attention to yourself but everyone's doing that 
you know, because it's a fancy dress party. What about like a protest or a public demonstration? You know, you might be wearing something to try and get the public's attention, holding signs, drawing attention to yourself. And you say, well, you shouldn't do that because you're being immodest. No, because it's, that's expected at a protest. You're trying to preach a message, right? You're trying to tell people um, what, are, what, you're, what you're trying to get out, the message you're trying to share. So that's number one. You know, wearing clothes that are modest, and they're modest in and of themselves, meaning they don't draw attention to themselves. But I do think there's that exception that there are certain events or certain things where what would normally be immodest are modest, like weddings and things like that. But if that's just how you're dressing every day, then I think uh, you might want to think about how you're dressing. Now the second thing is, let's go back to 1 Timothy 2. Second point is uh, clothes that draw attention to your wealth, right? So you've got clothes that draw attention to the clothes themselves, but then you have clothes that draw attention to your wealth and you know how financially well off you are. Um, look at what it says here in verse nine. Uh, it says, "Not with broidered hair or, or gold or pearls or costly array." Now let's just talk about broidered hair first of all. Broidered hair is, I believe. You know, when they have all their patterns in their hair, and they, they braid it and, and you know, you so, see some videos on YouTube, sometimes they appear in your feed, like those, uh, those uh, recipe videos where they like do up a lady's hair and like, oh, they can do all sorts of things with people's hair. But it probably took a long time to do. I mean, you're watching that video in like 10 seconds of, or 30 seconds of how they do this lady's hair, but it probably took them hours to do that. So, you know, this is, people that have broided hair, they're doing this every day. I mean, these are obviously people with a lot of time on their hands. You know, if you're paying somebody to do that, that costs a lot of money. You know, so I think this is about somebody, you know, sort of showing off their wealth, right? Showing off that they've got this fancy hair, all these jewelry, the expensive clothes. You know, I was, I was shocked. You know, I was dating a girl once. I was just shocked to find out how much girls spend on their hair. I had no idea like how much hairdressers charge. And I remember she went to get her hair straightened and then she was getting quotes at like different hairdressers. I was like, how much are they quoting it? And it was like five, six hundred dollars. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I, would, I thought that Asian girls with straight hair, like I thought just that's just how it was, you know, like they just, <laughs> they just comb it and then it's like straight. Cause like when I, when I, my hair was straight like that. I didn't realize they paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars to put all these chemicals in it to straighten it. Uh, and I just had no idea how much money women spend on their hair. Um, and that's why, like, the hair is mentioned here, because you can spend, you can pile a lot of money uh, into, into your hair, a lot of time. Um, you know, curling it, straightening it, and then recurling it again, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, you didn't like, now that it's curled, you want it straight again. It's straight, you want it curled. It's like every season you're changing, spending $500 each time. Just, just have the hair you want, and you can just save all that money. Um, you know, and colouring it as well, and you're colouring, you're destroying your hair every time you bleach it and colour it and things like that. You sp all that money that you're spending on your hair, um, you know, it's a waste of money. Um, and is it, is it a way that people show off their wealth? It could be. You know, I'm not saying everyone that does it is um, necessarily showing off their wealth, but that's what we're sort of talking about now, is like ways that people can show off their wealth. You know, it says here about costly array. So you've got your jewellery, obviously, that's, that's very expensive and your costly array. So clothes, that are expensive. And you know, like I was saying before, you know, I'm all for quality. If something is, you know, gonna break on you or, you know, you put it in the wash once and it's no longer wearable. I mean, that's where you wanna spend some money, right? On quality, because you're actually doing the cheaper thing. If you buy one thing once and it lasts you longer, that's better than just buying it again and again and again. But you know, let's face it, sometimes there are things where the branded item does the same thing as the non-branded item and people just want the branded item because they want people to see that they've got the branded item. Um, I was talking with somebody recently and you know, they were going to go buy some pajamas but instead of, you know, pajamas, I mean, nobody's even looking at them, right? You can, go to, you can go to Kmart, buy like $5 pair of pants, you know, $5 t-shirt, there you go, you got pajamas. But people want to buy like the Peter Alexander pajamas and spend like $80, $100 on a pair of pajamas. And like, and the pajamas are like so flimsy that like, they, I remember my friend bought me a pair of Peter Alexander pajamas for my birthday and then they just like tear so easily because they're just so, so, so like weak and soft and comfortable. <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> so, you know, like you don't have to spend all this money on expensive pajamas or 
You know, like, I, like I think, like for example, the handbag. You know, women spend like, like how much is an LV handbag? It's like fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. I mean, isn't it just do the same job as the, as a Kmart handbag? I mean, just putting stuff in the bag and just carrying things around. So, you know, just think about how you spend your money, and even like what I talked about this morning, like how are Christians spending your money? You know, you're just spending your money, just you know, buttering yourself up. You know, where that money could be used to to, to serve God, um, to do things for the kingdom of God. So, the costly array. Um, Philippians four five. I think this verse is very interesting. Um, I won't go into all the points I wanted to say about this verse, but look at what it says here. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, what's such an interesting verse about it is it's like an oxymoron. You know, because it's saying what you want to be known of you is the fact that you don't want to be known, like your moderation. You know, so it's like most people in the world. When they want to be noticed, it's their extravagance, isn't it? It's like about their fancy clothes, their fancy car, the fancy building, the fanciness, right? But God is saying here, let your moderation be known unto all men. So how a Christian ought to be known is how moderate they are and how self-controlled they are and how much they don't really want to be noticed. That's what they should be noticed for. Isn't that weird? It's like it's sort of like an oxymoron. Um, the Lord is at hand. I won't sort of go into this, but there's this theme throughout the Bible. I'll just show you one verse in First Pe uh, Second Peter. It says here, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holiness, holy conversation, and godliness? So this passage is saying here that one day Jesus is going to come back, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat, everything's going to be burned up. So it's saying, so what sort of person should you be? How should you live your life? How should you spend your resources? How should you spend your time? How should you spend your money? And that's really what we see here in Philippians 4, 5. It's saying, let your moderation be known unto all men. How are you going to live? Are you living moderately? Because the Lord is at hand. Because one day it's all going to go. Right? So how, how are you living your life? Now, that's why I'll say, like, moderation means that our life should be characterized by moderation. But I don't think it means that there are not times of immoderation. Do you know what I mean? Because let's say if you're, if, you're mod if you're living in modesty, in moderation, it doesn't mean that you're just constantly at medium. It just means that you're in moderation, meaning there are times when there's ups, there's times when there's down, but on, on average, it's moderate. Because there w I think there will be times where you will do things of extravagance. Like, like we talked about with the clothing, there are times where you'll dress up. You know, for the wedding or whatever. And that kind of, could be like that. You know, you're generally a person that's quite tame. You, you're very frugal. But then you have a celebration, like a wedding or an anniversary or a, a, a milestone birthday, where you do want to do something a bit more extravagant and, ex and celebrate and throw a party. And I don't think that's wrong, because obviously even God, He's going to throw the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's going to do some things that are extravagant. Um, but it's not how we ought to be known unto all men. Our moderation ought to make us known unto all men. So there are things, I think, where there are times of extravagance, and I mentioned a few. Um, even sporting victories, right? Because when we win our first futsal game, hey, maybe I'll go out and I'll spend a bit of money to have some ice cream with you guys. You know, I'll do something a little extravagant. Um, I think the occasion calls for it, right? So... You know, moderation, it doesn't only apply to clothing, right? There's other aspects of moderation. So, you know, we talked about, you know, dress. You know, women's makeup, you know, your makeup should be moderate. Um, your hair, you know, your physique, you know, men's physique. I mean, it's one thing to want to be slim and to be healthy, but you don't have to be like, you know, those people that are like showing their abs off and all that sort of stuff, you know, because it's like, are you being moderate in how much time and, uh, and energy you're investing into your physique? Um, jewelry, you know, there's, I think there are times to wear jewelry, but, you know, be moderate about it. Uh, materialistic possessions, you know, maybe pleasures, you know, holidays. There's nothing wrong with going on a long overdue holiday, but people that are just going on these extravagant holidays once, twice a year, all the time, I think it's not a good use of your money. 
uh, even on technology or on your home, right? People have these really extravagant homes, but one day, you know, it's all just going to be burnt up. It's all just going to go. <coughs> How are you spending your life and your money? So that's two. So first one is clothes that draw attention to themselves. Second is clothes that draw attention to your wealth. And the last one um, is clothes or the lack thereof clothes that draw attention to your body. Now, I think this can apply to guys as well, obviously, right? Like if guys sort of work out and they, they've got big muscles and things like that, and then they specifically wear clothes that accentuate those muscles, I don't think that's being modest. But I think it more applies to women because, you know, women don't lust after men as much as men lust after women. That's just a biological fact, right? Um, if we're talking about stereotypes. So when we think of these passages, like in 1 Timothy, what are these teaching? These, teaching? these are teaching that the adorning, the beautifying of a woman ought to be the inward man, you know, but, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So the outward adorning, the clothes that draw attention to your body, this is not how a, a woman, a Christian woman, ought to be seen as beautiful. Um, it ought to be the inward man. So when we think about clothes that draw attention to the body and to the sensual features of a woman, you know, your appearance should emphasize your personality. Like when, when somebody looks at you, if their first thought is, oh, you know, she's got a nice figure, she's got nice this, nice these features, that's not what you want. You want somebody to look at you and think, you know, this is a godly woman. And I'm thinking about her personality. Now, obviously, how men think about women should not be the basis for how we dress. It's just one thing that we want to consider. Because obviously, if men controlled how women dress, you might come across like a Muhammad, right? And then Muhammad just wants women just wearing tents all the time, <laughs> and you can't see anything. So, you know, it's, it's about taking it into consideration, you know, and, and an issue of the conscience. You know, when I dress, you know, am I trying to make men look at my breasts? You know, am I, am I purposely wearing a low cut dress? Or, you know, I've seen these dresses that have like this window right here. I mean, if you've got a window right here, I mean, what are you, what are you trying to get people to look at? You know, you're not trying to get people to look at your face. You know, if you have, you have a dress that has like a window right on your, on your cleavage. Um, or, or, you know, even like, uh, I, I know like a lot of women wear things where basically it really accentuates the features. Like it'll draw attention to the buttocks. It'll draw attention to the breasts and things like that. So you've got to think about what you're wearing um, and you might think it's cute, but, you know, men are going to last after you and you don't want to necessarily encourage that. You know, it takes, it takes zero talent. It takes zero intellect to take your clothes off so that you get attention. You know what I mean? Like it takes zero talent and, and it takes zero intellect to wear something that is immodest so that men will pay attention to you. But it takes some spirituality. It takes walking in the flesh. It takes some intellect and, and, and some talent for men to notice you for who you are rather than just how you look. Um, so, you know, that's why you, sometimes you see these, uh, these online personalities and they have millions and millions of subscribers, millions and millions of followers. Um, and it's just because they're, they're dressing immodestly. That doesn't take any talent. You know, any girl can start a YouTube channel topless and then get millions of subscribers. It's because they're not after what you're, they're actually going to say. You know, they're after because they want a free show. And it's the same when you dress. You, know, you want people to befriend you because of what, who you are and what you have to say, not just because of how you look. Um, you know, it's like likes on Facebook photos. You know, like, like when some women, they take photos of, of themselves and put them on Facebook and say, oh, you know, what do you think? And they like getting all the likes and the loves and the, you know, whatever. It doesn't take any talent to do that. You know what I mean? Anyone could take a photo of themselves in the bathroom and then post it and people are going to like it. You know, if you want to get an opinion of how you're dressed, you know, ask people that actually love you. You know, and they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you, like, you know, stop wearing that dress or stop wearing that shirt. It's too, it's too revealing. Um, that's how you ought to get opinions, not from your buddies on Facebook that want a free show. So we see here, you know, in, um, in this passage... The shamefacedness, that's what's referring to the clothes that don't draw attention to your body because shamefacedness means you have shame. You don't, you're, you're, you're ashamed when, at the thought of people seeing your nakedness or nearly showing it, right? Because you might say, well, I'm, I'm in this mini skirt, my nakedness is covered, but it's still suggesting it. It's still uh, pointing people towards it. Um, you ought to have that shame. What does it say in First Peter? Let's go First Peter three two. 
It says here, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So chaste is when you're pure. Chastity is when you're a virgin. So your clothes ought to make people think that you're chaste. You know, some people, some girls dress in a way where they may be a virgin, but when they see you dress that way, do they think you're a virgin? You know, like there are some ladies that dress in a way like that girl's probably not a virgin, you know, although she might be. So that's part of wearing chaste clothing. Um, let's go to that famous ver verse in Proverbs. Where it talks about here, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the street, and lieth in wait at every corner. So in Proverbs, we learn about a woman with the attire of an harlot. That means she's got clothing of a prostitute. Now it doesn't tell us what that clothing is, but then you've got to ask yourself, you know, when I look at what I'm wearing, when I look at what this person's wearing, do they look like a prostitute? Like if I had a group of prostitutes and then I had me and my girlfriends there, do we look the same? Is there any differentiation between like this group? I mean, some prostitutes might dress better than some girls these days, you know, in terms of more covered up. Um, so you got to think about these things. You know, obviously the reason why a harlot is dressing in a certain way is because she's trying to draw attention to her features, to entice men to want to sleep with her and to pay her to want to sleep with her. So this. A this lady here in Proverbs 7.10 is the opposite of what a Christian should be. She's trying to draw attention to her body. And look, she is loud and stubborn. But what ought the Christian woman to be? Not draw attention to your body. And you ought to be meek and quiet with shamefacedness and sobriety. And I'll go into this a bit more next week. But, you know, you need to consider your brothers in Christ. You know, you, you, yes, I don't think that necessarily the lusts of men ought to dictate what you wear, because obviously you just wear a t-shirt, a, a guy might last after you, right? They can see anything. So, you know, should, should you just be dressed in like, you know, you have like support structures <laughs> and it's like a circle and then you just got this thing just coming down, just totally hiding everything. I mean, even then, I mean, guys will probably have thoughts because they're just thinking, oh, I bet she's flying underneath that outfit or something like that. So, you know, you're not going to control the lusts of men, but it's something that you ought to consider. You know, like a woman shouldn't have the attitude of like, well, I'm just going to wear this because I like it. I don't care what, what men think. I don't care if men lust after me. That's what I believe God does not like. That, that women ought to have the liberty to dress how they want, but then they should be governed by love. They should be governed by charity and consider how men are going to look at you and, and are they going to lust after you and should you dress differently. So, you know, women, you ought to get the opinions of men around you if you're unsure. If you're unsure and say, you know, do you think my outfit is modest or not? I mean, a man that loves you, like your father or your husband, he's going to tell you. Um, or your brother that loves you. <coughs> um, not your Facebook friends, you know. So, so keep that in mind. So I'll end it there, but those are the three principles. And I'll go into a bit more specifics next week. But one, clothing that draws attention to itself, clothing that draws attention to your wealth, and then clothing that draws attention to your body. I think those are the three areas we need to think about. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord, as we continue to study this topic, um, pray that you would mold and change us, that your Holy Spirit would uh, speak to us, that our consciences would convict us. And Lord, our standard of how we dress and how we use our resources and how we use our money would, would increase. And Lord, we would keep our eyes focused on you. We'd think about the things of eternity. Um, so Lord, I pray that you continue to use and mold this church. Um, me as well, Lord. I'm not, I'm not uh, immune to the things preached today. I haven't arrived. I uh, pray, Lord, that you continue to build and uh, uh, mold us according to your will. Um, thank you, Lord. Thank you that uh, we have this church here. I pray that you'd continue to lead and guide us in where we're to go from here. And we thank you. We pray you, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.